As we come to the message today, uh, I want to speak to you on a, a subject that I know all of us at uh, some point in time have had to face. And you know, I just find that there's a lot uh, going on today in our culture, and that is uh, criticism. Uh, I want to speak about criticism today. If you'll uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verses uh, 21 through 23. And the title of my message today is that Thin skin will lead to sin. <laughs> you you got to have tough skin today. If, if you've got thin skin, you're not going to make it in this culture because criticism is in abundance. There's no lack of criticism uh, in our culture today. Uh, we start at the very top and go down to the very bottom. And we see that Jesus gives us an example. And he says in, Peter says in verse 21, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And, you know, I know this is uh, talking about Christ dying on the cross and how that when he died on the cross that, you know, there were people railing on him and people were... Uh, throwing insults and that he had been, as we just got finished celebrating communion, how that he had been beaten and how he had been whipped. So I know that this is the reference to this passage. But I, I think that we can draw out a principle uh, from this, and that is if the Lord was insulted, if the Lord was ridiculed, if the Lord was made fun of, if the Lord was threatened, and Peter says that he has given us an example. Now, I know, again, it's talking about suffering, but for some people, criticism is a form of suffering. Yeah. And we need to learn how to deal with it. And so as we come today, let us open our hearts to see what the Lord would say with this issue. Father, we come to you today. Oh, God. I know that as a pastor, and any time you make a decision, that there may be some that are in agreement and some that are not in agreement. And Lord, I realize that sometimes uh, uh, from the, the ones that might not agree, the criticism will begin. And so Lord, it's like that in all of our lives, that uh, as I'm going to show a slide, here in a second, to avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. And so, Lord, we realize that this is going to happen to all of us at some point in time. So, Lord, let us dive deep into your word today, and we invite the congregation to come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine. Come and dine, the master's calling. Come and dine. Feed us, Lord, at your table. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, we live in a culture today, and I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you, where criticism abounds. And all we need to do, and, and it seems like, it's a constant theme among pastors in their preaching that they mention it, 
but all that's related to this pandemic, right? People criticize you if you wear a mask and if you don't wear a mask. They criticize you if you've been vaccinated or if you are unvaccinated. They criticize you if you're a Republican or a Democrat. So it's just, it's just out there. And, and you know, my, my heart as a pastor is, is to realize that all this is out there, but keeping the saints of God together and saying we have a, a greater purpose than the things that are dividing the world. And so, no matter what circles you're in, what side you're on, that somebody is eventually going to say something that is critical of something that you believe. And so we want to talk about today, how, how do you handle this criticism? That when you find yourself in these situations, and as I, I said earlier, to avoid criticism, to avoid criticism, to avoid criticism, don't do anything. Just sit back in your crib, right? Don't go anywhere. You'll get Uber to uh, uh, bring your food to you, right? Pay your bill. Don't go anywhere. Just stay locked up, right? To avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. But even if you lock yourself up and Uber delivers all your food, Somebody's going to criticize you for not coming outside your house, right? They, they, they're going to find a reason to criticize you. And so we need to realize that everything that is done that is, could be under scrutiny and that we need to have thick skin as the people of God. What is criticism? Uh, criticism is the act of finding or pointing out fault. And, you know, there are many people who have uh, licensed themselves as criticism inspectors. And uh, they feel that it's their duty to find faults and point them out. But let me remind you of the words of Bishop Stephen Neal. He says this, criticism is the manure in which the Lord's servants grow better. Grow best. <laughs> Woo. Criticism is the manure in which the Lord's servants grow best. There are three types of criticism. There's what we would call constructive criticism. This is the type of criticism that points out a fault to help a person get better, that the heart of the critic is to help that person get better. I know, and I thank God for my wife, because she's my critic. And, 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 and sometimes I don't like it, right? Like, she'll, she'll tell me that, well, you know, that doesn't look right on you. Or uh, she'll tell me that, you know, you, you, you're not doing this, and you, and you need to do this. And if I... If, if, if on that day, I have my thin skin on, right, what's going to happen? I'm going to get upset. Yeah, I don't want to hear that, right? But, but I find on the days when I've got my thick skin on because I've spent time in the presence of the Lord, that uh, I've yielded my day to God, that I realize that her heart is pure. I realize that she's saying that because she wants to help me and she wants me to be my best. And that is constructive criticism. That's a good thing uh, because coming from the person that's being the critic, they want you to get better. Then there's what I call unproductive criticism. And this type of criticism points out the fault of another because something that you did not agree with their words or, or their actions. And, and so this is really unproductive. I, I, I'll give you a perfect example of unproductive criticism, uh, and that is Monday morning quarterbacks. All right? 
Monday morning. Man, Ben Roethlisberger, he can't throw the deep ball anymore. You know, all he can do is throw the short pass. Yo, know, why did Mike Tomlin go for it on fourth and one? Right? I mean, and, and, and we offer those criticisms, but guess what? They're very unproductive, right? Ben Roethlisberger is not going to throw a longer pass because you criticized him. That decision that Mike Tomlin made to go for it on fourth and one is not going to change. And so that's unproductive criticism. But then there is destructive criticism. And that's the focus of our message today, destructive criticism. And this type of criticism points out a fault to hurt and inflict pain upon a person. This type of criticism is seen on a job when someone is jealous of another employee that may have got a raise, that may have got a promotion, and then they begin to tear that person down. They begin to criticize that person. They begin to try to destroy their character. And this type of criticism is very harmful. And we as saints have to be careful that we're not caught up in destructive criticism, but also as saints, when it comes our way, we have to be ready to deal with it. In response to criticism, people take one of four demeanors. Some people have a pity party, and that is they have been affected negatively by the criticism, and they begin to feel a, 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 a sense of reaching out and, and, and even bringing others into their pity party, right? That, uh, man, you know what, you know what so-and-so did to me? I can't, I can't believe that, that they did this. And, and, and so now you begin to sit down at your dinner table and you begin to write invitations to your pity party. As subtle as they might be, you send them out to people because you want them to be sympathetic to you. You want them to feel what, what you have felt. Another response to criticism is to respond in anger, and that is to seek revenge or seek retribution. I, 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 I'm going to get this. I'm, I'm going to get after this person. I'm going to take them down. Another response is to be discouraged, uh, to allow discouragement to set in, even leading you to the point where you want to quit, where you want to throw your hands up in the air and quit. When I was growing up, we would play football. And in order for you to play football, this might sound very simple, that somebody had to bring the football. Right? You couldn't play football if you didn't have a football. And so some people would bring the football, and then maybe they didn't get selected uh, on the team. They, they might, somebody might have selected them last. Or maybe somebody started making fun of them because they missed or dropped the pass or uh, they did something to make a mistake. And then what would that person do? They would get mad, take their ball, and go home, <laughs> right? So that means that nobody was going to play at that point. That meant the game was over because they had been criticized and they got discouraged and they quit. But then I like this fourth solution, that whenever the critics come out, whenever they begin to launch their arrows of attack, that in the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to look at that in a second, that you answer with achievement. That when you are criticized, that you don't have a pity party, you don't get angry, you don't get discouraged, but you allow it to make you better. And you answer back in achievement. Let's look at some things that we can do when we go through criticism. The first thing that I encourage you to do is to take into account the messenger. Take into account the messenger. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, 
when Sanballat heard and, and Nehemiah had been called by God to go back and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah goes back to begin the construction project. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. He mocked the Jews before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria and said, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was beside him, like somebody starts singing the chorus of criticism, and then others join in. And Tobiah said, indeed, even if a fox climbed upon what they are building, he would break their stone wall. Criticism. Nehemiah is doing a good thing. Nehemiah is being obedient to what God told him to do. And in the midst of him doing what God told him to do, the criticism starts to fly. And so we have to take into account the messenger. And that is, <laughs> consider the source. Consider the source. Who is leveling the criticism? That if you are being criticized, who is leveling the criticism? If it's a person with a bitter spirit, most likely the criticism is flowing out of their bitterness. When Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls, his enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, criticized him. These men had evil hearts. And this was the origin of their criticism. Consider the messenger. You know, oftentimes, people have comments that they want to make to me. And one of the first things I'll do is I'll consider the messenger. And if I think that, you know, this person, you know, loves the Lord, that this person loves God's word, this person, you know, wants to see God glorified, and this person is coming to me because they want to share something that will help me or go back and maybe even help the congregation. And you know what I do? I mean, I, I got a point later on that said we need to meditate on what's said to us. But I'm saying at this point, consider the critic, right? If, if it's a person that's, that's got a bitter spirit, if, a, if it's a person that uh, is, has evil intent, if it's a person that is trying to tear you down, then I would say that it might be a message that you can pass on because of the heart of the person that's, that's coming to you. You know, as I said earlier, uh, I don't always receive it right away if I got my thin skin on, but if I've got my thick skin on, uh, whenever my wife has something to say, that consider the critic. Somebody that loves me, somebody that's concerned about me, and somebody that wants the best for me. And so as you deal with it, that's the first thing that you have to do. You know, sense if this person is coming out of anger, out of bitterness, out of revenge, out of, as these guys were, an evil spirit, you have to consider the source. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. Uh, he was preaching and somebody didn't agree with his preaching. And they sent up a message to him. And uh, the message said, fool, F-O-O-L, fool. And Spurgeon took the note, he read it, and he said, this is very interesting. He said, this is the first time I received a note where somebody signed their name but didn't leave a message. <laughs> Fool, consider, consider the source. The second thing that I want to say is that you should take into account the mission. 
you should take into account the mission. What has God called you to do? And realize that if God has called you to do something, that there are people who will be critical. Look what it says in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. Sanballat and Gershom, Geshem sent me a message. Come, let us meet together in the villages of Ono. They were planning to harm me, right? So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing important work and cannot come down. Why should, I, uh, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? And notice this. Four times they sent to Nehemiah with the same proposal. Hey, come on down. Let us, let us meet in the plain of Ono. Let us talk this over. Four times they sent this message. And Nehemiah says, four times I gave them the same answer. You have to take into account the mission. And to realize criticism must not take us off of our mission for God. That sometimes Satan sends people to be critical to take you off of the mission. If this is something that you know God has called you to do, something that God has put in your heart, God has put in your spirit, you have to stay focused on the mission. I like the NFL officials, those of you who watch football games on Sundays, that the officials will make a bad call. And then what happens? Everybody, well, let's put it, the hometown, if it's a, what do they start doing? They start booing, right? They start booing, boo, boo. I mean, and it can go on, right? And especially now they've got these jumbo screens, and if the official uh, make a bad call, they can look up on the screen and see that it's a bad, and then, oh, man, then, then it's on, right? What does the official do, right? Does he? Hey, look, look, y'all don't, you, you didn't see what I saw. You know, you're not down here on this field. You know, I, I'm doing my best to try to make, that's not what the official does. What does the official do? He keeps it moving. He keeps it moving, why? Because he has a mission. And his mission is to officiate the game. And even if he made a bad call, he can't go out and begin to address the people in the stands. He got to stay on point. He got to stay on mission. And we have a mission. And if people began, begin to be critical of our mission, then we have to understand that we can't allow them to knock us off point, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Jones will appreciate this statement here. If you want to lead the orchestra, you have to turn your back to the audience. <laughs> if you want to lead the orchestra, you got to turn your back to the audience, right? You, you, you can't be influenced by the people in the audience. That, that you have to uh, stay focused on what it is that you're about. And you can't allow the criticisms to begin to drown out the mission that God has for you. The next thing that I want to say is you have to take into account the multitude. You have to take into account the multitude. Proverbs 14, 11, 14 says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, their safety. Amen. If there are a number of people who are coming to you about the same thing, you need to give that strong consideration. You just don't need to blow them off now. If there's a number of people coming, then you need to give that consideration because if it's more than one person, there may be something to it. <laughs> I heard this a long time ago. If one person calls you a donkey, dismiss it. If two people call you a donkey, consider it. If three people call you a donkey, 
Saddle up. <laughs> Saddle up. Right? I mean, we need to realize that if it's more than one person that's coming to us, and, and, and I'm not saying that uh, people got together and, you know, talked and then came to you. I'm just saying, like, people independently say, you know what, you know, I, I, you know, I just need to share this with you. You know, it, it needs to be considered. I remember early on in my ministry, I've, I've been pastor here at Bethany going on for 32 years now. And I remember early on in the ministry, a group of individuals took me out to lunch. And I, I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be nice, you know. Uh, they taking me out to lunch. And, uh, man, they began to tell me, Man, your, your sermons have no meat in it. You know, you, 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 you're letting other people run the church. Uh, I mean, just what, I mean, and, and by the time that lunch was over, I felt like whatever was on the menu, Pastor Glaze was on there too. Man, I left, I left there demoralized. I, I, I left there feeling like, man, you know, do, do, do I need to, to, to be doing this? And... I, man, it was, it, was, it was devastating to me. Young pastor, you know, and, you know I, I was, began to think, man, maybe this is not the place for me. And uh, somehow, you know, I didn't even share that with I didn't even share that with my wife. You know, and, and somehow the Lord just gave me the strength to, to make it through. And one of the things that uh, he showed me is that these individuals had got together and they had began to talk because they didn't, there were issues that they were seeing, even above what they addressed me on, that they wanted to come out of their own selfishness and out of their own protection to keep things a certain way. And the Lord opened up my mind and opened up my spirit. And I was saying that even though it was three of them, that they had got together and began to talk about how they were going to have roasted pastor and barbecue pastor, right? Whereas the rest of the feedback that I was getting from the congregation was exactly opposite of what they were saying. And so that's why I'm saying that if we begin to get things from more than one source, right, then we need to consider it, right? And plus, I knew, man, I, I knew I was studying. I was, I was giving people so much meat they could choke on it. No, <laughs> But we need to consider the multitude. And if more than one person is saying something, we need to take that into consideration. I'm just going to hit this real quick because I've already talked about this. Uh, take into account your mate, right? Take into account your mate. Uh, Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Take into account your mate. Take into account who's coming to you, as I said earlier. Your mates are your companions or people close to you. They are concerned about your welfare. Run the criticism by them and ask their honest opinion. Ask them not to sugarcoat it, but give you the straight medicine. All right. Uh, the next one, take into account the meditation. Take into account the meditation. Proverbs 9.9 9 says, give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Take into account the medica uh, meditation, that if we respond to criticism immediately, it is often out of our emotions. Think about that. When, when, when somebody criticizes you, the first thing it hits is a nerve. And you want to respond out of your emotions. But if we take time to meditate and reflect on, on it, we can respond in a way where we will have no regrets. Unless it is fabricated and an outright lie, there is usually a bit of truth in criticism. 
Look for the truth in the criticism and build on it to get better. Think about it. Think about the criticism. And then even if you feel that the criticism is, is just, that go back and thank the person for the criticism. Because it's constructive, as we said earlier. Constructive criticism. And if that person receives it as constructive, then go back to that previous slide. Look what Proverbs says. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. He will increase in learning. There's no fool like an old fool who says we've been doing it all, we've been doing it this way all this time, and I ain't changing anything. Right? It's like the guy who was in the deacons meeting, and they were uh, voting whether to get a new chandelier, and he was against everything. And he said, uh, when they went to vote, they said, well, brother so-and-so, how come you're not voting for it? He said, I'm against it. He said, I'm against it. They said, well, why are you against it? He said, well, first of all, we can't afford it. And the second thing is what we need is more lights. <laughs> right? <laughs> he wasn't open to instruction. He wasn't open to receiving instruction. And Solomon says, give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. And then my final point is take into account the master. Take into account the master. Proverbs 15 and verse 32. He that refuseth instruction despises his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. There are times that we should not be too quick to dismiss the critic. We should ask ourselves, oh, hallelujah, is the Lord trying to speak to me through this person? Remember that even in one situation, God used a donkey to speak to a man. Right? And so sometimes we don't need to be too quick to dismiss the critic, but we need to say, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? through this? Are you trying to minister to me through this? And that we would be open to hear from the Lord. I close with this illustration. When the Lord first called me to Pastor Bethany, uh, we had a Wednesday night program. And my sons, uh, Daniel and Jonathan, you know, at the time they were uh, young boys, and I remember they came to this Wednesday night program, and we got in the car. And Dan, he was ready to cry. And John, he was upset. He was ready to go fight somebody. And I said, well, what, what's wrong? And they said that, because, you know, we, I had just, I, I, you know, I pastored the church before I came here in Brook Neal, Virginia. You talk about out in the country. Some godly people that love the Lord. Man, I, there was there were some great people in that church. Brook, but it was in Brook Neal. Country. All right. And so my wife, when she bought shoes, she was buying the Kmart special. And you know, they were wearing these shoes from Kmart, right? And some of the other kids had name brand shoes. It started, they started making fun of, of my kids' shoes. That's the reason one was upset and one was angry, right? Then I remember I, I talked to them and I, I told them, I said, you know, right now they're going to make fun of your tennis shoes. I said, as you grow older, they're going to make fun of other things and that you need to learn how to handle these little criticisms so that when the big criticisms come, you'll be able to handle it. And then I said, I want you guys 
to listen to this song. And I played this song for him. And here are the words to this song. There's always somebody talking about me. But really, I don't mind. They try to block and stop my progress most of the time. Well, the mean things you say, they don't make me feel bad. I've got the best friend I've ever had. I've got Jesus. And that's enough. You know, there's, all, there's been so many times when I didn't have a dime. Didn't tell nobody but the Lord. You know, he heard my plea and came to see about me. He's my all in all. When you press me down, Jesus picks me up. He stands by me when the going gets tough. I got Jesus. I got Jesus. And that's enough. I was trying to let them know that people are going to talk about you. People are going to criticize you. People are going to malign you. But you have to have tough skin. And when they talk about you, let it be the criticism, especially if it's unfounded, that it rolls off your back like water off a duck. But if there's something to be considered, that you would take the opportunity, begin to think about it, and take to heart what might be meant in and through the criticism. Father, we come to you today and we thank you, Lord, that if we have thin skin, especially when it comes to this area of criticism, sometimes that will lead to sin. It will lead us to get angry. It will lead us to have a pity party. It will lead us to be depressed. So Lord, don't let criticism lead us to sin. But Lord, help us as Nehemiah did to turn it into a motivator for achievement, to do things that glorify you. And then, Lord, if we have to consider it, we pray that you would give us the Holy Spirit so that we can work through that criticism to see what part of it is unfounded and see if there's any truth that we need to deal with and apply to our lives. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who is our example, who says when he was insulted that he did not insult back, when he was railed upon that he did not rail back, but he committed himself to the one who was in control of all things. And so we thank you for that. And that same Jesus who gives us the example of how to handle criticism is the same Jesus who is here today for that one who might not know him as their Lord and Savior. And so if there's one today that does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, we pray they might open up their heart and they might say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for allowing your blood to be shed that I might have eternal life. And right now, I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And my friend, if you prayed that prayer from the heart, then we encourage you to get in contact with us here and let us know about that decision. And someone will follow up with you so that you might grow in the faith. If you have more questions about what it means to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, contact us here, 412-242-3255. Someone will follow up with you. Leave us your name and contact information. Thank you, Lord, that your word covers many areas that we deal with in life. And thank you that even in the area of criticism that you have, advice for us and so we commit this message to you we commit the hearts of God's people to you in Christ's name we pray amen